There's not a lot written on this, I was chatting with someone earlier, um, and, but I have found three books. The middle one was my inspiration, which currently is holding up the projector, but if you want to see it afterwards. It's called Stone Shelters, written in 1969 by my mentor, Ed Allen, who was an architect professor at MIT. And he, in 1969, went on a Fulbright scholarship with his wife to study these buildings and these shelters. Uh, one on the left is Architecture Without Architects uh, by Bernard Rudofsky, which was published by the Museum of Modern Art in the 60s. But that one is more worldwide, and just a brief what you mean by Architecture Without Architects. Well, it's long before we had issues of what it really looked like, and, and you know, styles, and just architecture, etc. Uh, he was investigating what did people build in primitive cultures and indigenous cultures with the materials they had at hand. If you think back to when people were first building buildings, they did them for very few reasons. To survive, for shelter, and maybe to worship, something like that. Um, so there wasn't a lot else driving the forms, and that's what I'm really interested in. Not just that, but the materials and how the forms and the materials are made. That's really what I teach. And then last night, I just found this one this week in our school library, Coral Domes by Rodolfo Lubecki, who I, I admire, I read her story. She, she's fascinated, she's a photographer, had a different career, but then photography played into it. She started photographing Coral Domes. The two books that he shot are all about buildings all over the world. Ed's is about Apulia specifically, and an Italian of Apulia, which is the southeastern part of Italy, right here on the map in red. So not the blue, but over on the Adriatic side. Um, and then Rome and Milan is right up here, Rome's here, and Bari is right about here. And then there's another city called Brindisi. I used to call it Brindisi, but I learned when I was there. And that's a significant port because that's a leaping off point to get over to Greece. Um, so that's those two cities are on the coast. But the geography and topology or topography uh, figure into why these buildings got built the way they did and why they look the way they do. And that's what Ed's book really starts to get into. So there's probably that's an olive tree, I'm guessing, these, these fields and uh, terrain built with olive groves. So a few definitions. There will not be a quiz, but truly for the title of my talk are the name of these little small structures, dry laid masonry, no mortar, and uh, conical roofs. And there's a reason why they come in this shape and the materials they do. Vernacular is probably a work of here, but we use a lot of architecture. It's a common building style of period of place. So there is a Cape Cod vernacular. This is the West Coast, so this is about southeastern Italy. Corbel is a type of vault, I'll go into that a little later. Uh, and Puglia, this is the region, Southern Peninsula, Adriatic Sea, and the Ionian Sea. Um, it's not very touristy, uh, it's starting to get a little more, uh, but it's not like your major Roman cities that you see advertised on posters and on TV, etc. Uh, but very rural, very beautiful, um, and I highly recommend a trip there if you can get there. So here's another map for you. The red circle on the right is the region. The other circles indicate where uh, there are other buildings of this type in this region. So the climate factors into this as well. So over in the Palma Mallorca and Sardinia and Sicily, a lot of them are there. And so, you know, I do these research projects, as David mentioned, and I'll cook up the topic. So the themes here are an architect and an engineer. I'm very interested in the structure of buildings stand up. And it's fascinating to learn about these, but one of the fun things about these trips is I learn about something else. I'm like, oh, uh, I can go spend a whole day doing that. So I keep notes and maybe other talks will come out of it. Um, so these are what some of those structures look like in those other three places that I just circled on the prior map. So we're going to see a lot of images like this. So what I want you to take away from this one right now is just there's pretty much stones stacked on stones. And you know, there was a lot of intuition. The, the public building thing documents that CE says and budgets or anything, right? But there was a lot of intuition with the people in that land. They needed a place to store maybe uh, animals or grain or food or shelter. So they'd stack one rock on top of another, see if they could balance it, and lo and behold, we get structures like this. It's probably passed down by tradition. There were a lot of them, so you can see what the guy down the road might have done, and you kind of copy that and help each other. But these are kind of more civic or infrastructure looking, maybe large communal storage or something. The ones we're going to focus on later are actually housing. They started out as rural shelters or sheds for nomadic shepherds. So the geology and topography of this area, which you can really appreciate when you're there, um, factors in. And I hope I have some photos that do uh, speak to that. So Emerge is a high rocky plateau, and there are three in this whole region. 
and they are, you know, you can kind of feel it when you're driving along, and you say, oh yeah, you feel like you're up on top of something. And that's where these get built. But what's interesting is the rocks underneath, this isn't deep, dark, rich, fertile soil, this is actually limestone. Um, and there are no rivers, except there's one river in all of this region, so it's very dry, uh, which is another reason why they didn't need water, um, and it's limited to what can be grown there. So this is an image from Ed's book, uh, Stone Shelter book, and if you can see the white region, that's the plateau of the marriage of the Trubia, so one of those three plateaus. And the shaded uh, dotted areas, that indicates the slope off of that, so it slopes down to the ocean, which kind of makes sense on each side. So it's kind of running down the center of this peninsula. And these are the villages that I visited, and I stayed in one uh, right there of Stumi, um, and then there's Alvaro Bell, which I'll focus on. The black dots indicate a high concentration of the truth, which I haven't shown you yet. Uh, I should have mentioned that very first image with all those little cones on the top. Those are the tops of the buildings. And those shapes have significance. So in this area, the, the vernacular architecture really reached its height in this region. There's a concentration of it, which is why it is now studied as well, because it exists, it's there, you can access it, and they're still intact, uh, and many of them are still used. So the plateau is about 1,000, 2,000 feet above sea level, 40 by 25 miles, so this is a significant area. Uh, there's one slow river in the middle, but it's north of where I was. I never did see it. The ground surface is this sponge of stones, this unusual material. You can still see it all along the roadsides. Um, it's kind of got this white mottled look to it. Um, there's red soil from decomposing limestone. There's, there's other soft sandstone-like sedimentation called Tupo. You know, population back centuries, certainly, and then the, the Appian Way. So that's, that's what I mentioned. So that name rang a bell. I didn't know much about it. So Google Appian Way, and that was the great Roman road that went from Rome to Brindisi, and that was the, the trade route to get over to Greece. So that runs across this plateau and it's still in part of these villages. But that's a whole other topic. So this is what you see out your rental car window as you're driving along from the uh, airport heading south into this uh, into this area. Uh, some of these photos are mine, some are captured from the UNESCO uh, website, which I'll show you that um, if this, this one village is the UNESCO heritage site. Um, but you can see not super forested, so it's not heavily tree, um, a lot of stone walls, kind of dry looking, piles of stones that were there. I mean, another thing you think of, uh, perhaps you experience this when you travel, you go to a different place, it is different, but you do find things that are similar, right? Farmers in New England for how long are we taking rocks out of the fields to make stone walls? So it's not like we invented it. Uh, you see it in different places. Um, so that's a good image, and you sort of do kind of feel like you're up on something there. But if you're right along the coast, you can get these great views as well. And this is a Polygono Amare, is a city right on the coast uh, uh, of the Adriatic. Um, but I include it to show um, the rock formations there. You can really get a feel for the ground there. It's, it's very present, it's large, it's very photogenic, but it really influenced the buildings. Um, and so this is a little city there on the way down, stop for lunch. Um, this is not my photo, but the limestone, uh, you can see how, and lunch was a softer stone than other, like granite and other stones. And that's important because it's, uh, it's not as heavy to lift, it's more malleable to work with. You don't need fancy tools to cut it and things like that. And it's plentiful in this region. So it's a real confluence of sort of a need for shelter, a locally sourced, readable material that's easy to work with, and then it results in these buildings. So classic shot, here's these little pieces of rock and stone on the side of the road. The olive groves in this region are plentiful. And then I'll add this photo in as well. These are those villages that I had pointed out earlier. So Spoonie, um, Loco uh, Rotondo, Martina Franca, and uh, uh, I forget the other one, but these are all the way to this region of this plateau. But these aren't the truly yet. I'm kind of pulling up the suspension. Um, these are later. Uh, bigger hill towns, so you're probably familiar with hill towns in Italy. Those were built for reasons for protection, to be up on a plateau. It's safer. You can group there, you get better access to breezes, etc. And there are some fields around. But these are more masonry structures, more uh, traditional, and maybe even into concrete. So that's what thoughts the landscape. But when you get into other villages, you do start to see some of the truly which are coming up. So this is another view. But I show this here significantly because you see a lot of flat roofs here, very common in the Mediterranean. 
uh, uh, truly are distinctive for their conical roofs. And I'll show you how they achieve that shape with the stones that they selected specifically for that use. There's a natu national park uh, in this region, about this region, and it's not just about the village, but it's also about the, the, uh, uh, the geography and the topography, as I mentioned earlier. And these are not all in one place. Um, this is not my photo, but from the National Park website that they are trying to preserve these as well. Um, so you can really start to see some similarities in all of these. They're not big, they're all one story, most of them have conical roofs, very small doors, um, probably oriented in a specific direction. Even some of these have the little uh, cap on the top of the roof there. Some of them look fairly primitive, and that's how they started. In fact, uh, another great thing doing this research, the fun stories you learn. So, I'm not sure exactly what time, but probably in the feudal era of this region, uh, the, there was a tax imposed on permanent structures. So, landlords like forever, right? They don't want to necessarily be taxed for these permanent buildings. But some of these buildings were actually dismantled and then rebuilt, dismantled and then rebuilt. And then the culture allowed that because of the nomadic culture of these farmers and uh, shepherds, etc. But then slowly they started to take root, so to speak, and form villages, and these buildings became more permanent. So one more map here. Uh, so this is the village I want to focus on. It's called El Bonobello, which ironically means beautiful tree. Um, and I think what I've read is that the, there was a beautiful tree when they settled in this village or something like that, right? because there are no trees at all in building structures. These are all about stonework. There's occasionally some small pieces of wood. And I, I teach structures to my architect students, and I take them through 5,000 years of structures. And I was wondering, what was the first wood building? And where this beautiful old wood building here? In the comment, which is pretty old for this region. And my theory is that there probably were wood structures older than we know about, but we, the wood didn't last, right? We have the Pantheon, we have these stone structures that last thousands of years because they're stone. But wood structures probably predate our knowledge of them, but they didn't last because they're wood and they, they brought away. So finally, we get to the little village of Alvarobello, and this is what it looks like. Um, and it's almost magical, um, and this is the largest concentration of them. Um, and it's a, uh, it's uh, there's sort of two sides to the little village on two hills, and there's a beautiful piazza down the center in the low spot. And as you can imagine, I joked about the rental car earlier. Uh, these are villages that are built on little hilltops long before cars were even, it, not even just pretended, but even imagined, right? So lots of beautiful tiny paths. And that's why the piazza works so well, because you can leave your car there and sort of walk up into the, into the village. Uh, you, you will see some modern conveniences in here. I've been looking, I'm convinced there's probably a satellite dish in here somewhere, but I can't see it. Uh, but there's some railings and some chimney caps that are modern. There's even a sort of gable through here. But the cones are really what they truly are. Most of them are small, single spaces. You can group them. Uh, you can put it on a round plan very easily because of the conical dome. That's sort of where the dome came from. How do you cover a round space? You can also build a round conical dome on a square space. And some images will show that. And then how they achieved that was through their manipulation of the shapes and placement of the stones. So sort of the construction techniques. So I mentioned the the, uh, the, the streets and the plan. So this is a drawing by Ed Allen in his book. Uh, uh, we Architects call this a figure ground drawing. So the black are solid, the solid black are buildings, the little white alleys are streets, and then the white in between the buildings are probably the courtyards and backyards. Uh, and we do this a lot. We still teach this to our students to study what things look like, how dense they are, and this is an incredibly dense arrangement. Right? We now have acre and a half lots where we live, but back in the day, these are tiny spaces. Um, and just to give you an idea of the concentration of them, so this is one half of that village. And this image here, I'll show you several times actually. It's sort of like the postcard image of this town. Um, if you see it, um, this is the main street in El Rebello. And you get a great shot at the roofs with the little uh, cones at the top. And then also, um, you see these sort of paintings there. And I, I dug into that a little bit. I, I'm not 100% sure, but from what I understand, those were uh, Either markings by the mason who built the house. Uh, some of them are good luck charms, sort of like a horseshoe to ward off evil spirits. Some have religious connotations, certainly. There's a cross in one of them down there. There's a sun here. So maybe some uh, worshiping kind of things like that. Um, so if you're all interested, just Google truly UNESCO. It's a wonderful website that goes into great detail on where they are, what they are, how they were built, which 
just some of the information I'm sharing with you tonight. So to apply to be on, it's like being on the National Register, you have to apply and make the case. So this, this was done back in the uh, 96, I think, officially, but as early as 1909, uh, it was, it, there was interest in saving us and being aware of it. And I think why that is, is because of the concentration of them and because they were intact and they were still being used. And interestingly, for better or for worse, they're now seeing yet another life as Airbnbs. Um, which, okay, I mean, I got to stay at home, which is kind of fun, uh, but then that's bringing swimming pools, which the locals told me they weren't so much a fan of having this, you know, 500 year old truly with a swimming pool next to it. But that's progress. So the characteristics that they really touted for this application were the uh, dry stone building, that's a unique form of building without water um, because it's a different technique takes different materials, uh, so that's unique. Uh, the vernacular architectural ensemble, that's what I mean when I talk about the collection of them together. Uh, it's not just one of them, although you do see that occasionally driving along the roads. I was, remember, I got the rental cars coming out of Bari, driving south on the Autostrada, and there was one off in the field. I'm like, that's it, you can see it. You know, it, it's, it jumps out even right away. You see these, you know them. Uh, and then lastly, this is interesting, I think this is more of a UNESCO sort of aspect, is the, uh, it's a human style that, that's significant, that retains its original form. Um, so that's, I think, we can learn a lot about how people have lived over time and what their buildings uh, do and look like. Here's that same street from the other viewpoint. Uh, you can see some other features I'll talk about in a moment. These uh, roof drains right here. Um, the white cap um, on the top there, that's on the structural function actually, and the white is just decorative. Um, so you're building up the roof of these concentric rings of stone, and you need to close it off and, and cap it. So we capped it with this little pyramid, and then the, the top is just more decorative. Um, these are often juxtaposed right next to one another, and they can kind of blend. Um, but these are still probably, you know, they probably can, can be combined into multiple units, but a lot of them are just that one space. And most of them are one story. I think there's one building in the town that's a two-story Trulo. Trulo is the singular. And it's a museum that's very proud of it. So. But here's another good look at some of those symbols. Um, and this is the street, and I'm sure this one is probably maintained. You get the beautiful flowers and the whitewash. The whitewash is much more of just a traditional Mediterranean. It wasn't always whitewashed. Um, that might be later. Is it like a stucco floor? Yeah, exactly. It feels like that, exactly. So, some chronology. I expected people would ask, oh, when were we talking? That was one of my questions. Like, what are our errors here? So, I've tried to summarize some things here. The building of Truly in this style is thousands of years old. And we just saw some other ones that weren't exactly the Truly, but that's sort of the same style. Um, Alvaro Bello has had rural settlements uh, up to a thousand years ago. So, you know, we're 2022, so in the year 1000. Uh, these settlements gradually grew from these villages of uh, Ayacola and Monti in this region. I did not visit them, but they're in this region. And then about the middle of the 16th century, there were about 40 truly there documented in that era. 1620, coincidentally, we know that number around here. Um, this little village began to expand with the construction of a bakery, a mill, and an inn. And I put that in there, and as soon as I touched the mill, I said, wait a minute, I just told you there's no water. So how did they do that? And I don't know, but that's on my notebook to look at you further. And in the 18th century, the community about 3,500 people, so that's significant, right here in this area. And then about 1800, the steel rule ended, the name of Alvarabella was adopted, it was a royal town, and then the truly decline in, in construction. So the ones I've shown you there, trying to figure out, those are several hundred years old. Some of the ones in the field I'll show you later are even older. Um, because there's a whole series that are, uh, I don't know if abandoned is the right word, but they're just not maintained. So there were lots of wooden roofs, they, they believe, and they've had foundations, and how they might think that is they'll have a foundation with a pocket in it seems to make sense for a beam of wood, potentially. Um, there were some stone structures, caves naturally have been used throughout history, not just here, obviously. Uh, stone structures, cairns that you've seen piles of stones, and they can mean different things. But it's interesting that they go sort of from this agrarian storage shed, or maybe you start with a stone wall, and maybe around for a cistern, maybe for a well, and then eventually into a dwelling unit. And I mentioned the temporary, but then the more permanent. Uh, there are found <coughs> roof 
structures do remain in the region, but it did not reach a high level. And my sense is, if you're in that area, you got stone all around you and very few trees, you go with the stone, and there's less manipulation for the stones than with the tree. There's less tools to, to manipulate the stones. As I mentioned, there's a lot of intuition in building these. So a little bit of the technical part of the lecture. We'll look at some of the construction attributes from the drawing over here on the right. Uh, so, and no, no two are the same, but they're all very similar. So just if we look at the drawing quickly, this, they start with walls on either side. The walls are fairly wide. And that's done, I think, for a couple of reasons. One's for stability, to keep the structure upright. And the other is for the uh, climate. Uh, it's the thermal comfort, both in the winter, if you have a fire in it, and you can see a little fireplace to keep the warmth in, and in the summer to keep the, uh, the warmth out. Uh, and in the middle, those little dots, that's just sort of rubble. You know, they had plenty of it, so they could just stuff it, so they have a wall. And then you'll notice there's a very distinct difference sort of from this point up of the vault. And there's sort of two layers there. There's the big, larger blocks on the inside, which are the corbel vault. I'll go over that in a second. And then on the outside, these limestone pieces that actually form the roof. So um, you're perhaps familiar with the Roman arch, classic form. It is still, you know, the Romans perfected it. We're still using it. But a corbel means that you've got two stones that sort of stack in one another, you let one cantilever over the one below it, and then you do that with the next one, and the next one, and that's how you can reach out and meet the other side. And then they do something very interesting, but they, they still wind up with a smooth surface on the inside. I'll show you how they do that. So often there's a cistern down below for water, uh, and this is where you might see some wood that's presumed to be a small tree, perhaps, just to have a little loft, uh, right up the food ladder down the street. So dry lane again, no mortar. Uh, which is interesting. Um, it looks like an order here and asked about the stucco, so it's a solid wall. You can't like see through it, there's not holes in it. But it's not more uh, physically, mechanically to fasten. Um, the, the, the whitewash is just sort of a covering, more of a enclosure system, I guess is my favorite word. Uh, round square floor, as I mentioned, and mostly uh, single stories. So here's our arch diagram. And the the, at first glance, they look fairly similar, but the key difference is this top here. See that keystone right there? That wedge one? On the right image, all of those stones are pushing against one another to stay stable. But you typically need centering or false work, form work, to build that type of arch. So wood. And you need to build that first and then build the stone on top of it. But on the left over here, you can just take a stone and put it on top of the other stone. And if you put it too far, it's going to tip over. So what do you do? You bring it back a little. That's what I mean about this intuition of how you build these. The, the, the structure will tell you right away. Uh, and that's a corbel arch, uh, as we see in most of these. So the conical roofs. Uh, I'll go through this pretty quick. I want to show you some images. But they use limestone slabs, so it's a different shaped stone, very flat, much thicker than the slate stone that we're used to. Um, you know, maybe about that size, like a large serving plate kind of thing, a couple inches thick. Um, and those would get stacked again, but almost like shingles. And you'll see that in this image here. So they're placed that the upper ones don't correspond. What that means is you don't stack them up right like a brick wall. You stagger the bricks for a brick pattern. Same thing for these stones. And other pinnacles, as we've seen, have varying shapes. So there's a roof of one. Um, this is one of my photos. I don't recall where it is. I think this is, uh, I did a walking tour with uh, someone in the region that Ed and Mary had connected me with. It's an American architect who has moved to this region to uh, grow olives and sell olive oil and study the true leaves. So it sounds like a great job to me. Um, and she was a wonderful tour guide. Um, but you can get an idea of the shape, the color, also the texture. These, are, you know, these buildings are incredibly photogenic, as you've seen. And it's really fun to look at them up close. As I was lucky enough to do. So there's a museum in Alvarabello about the village, and you can go in there and learn about the construction of them, and also the people. There's a whole other you know, talk on that, right? Who were the people who lived there? I'm focusing on the building primarily, but these are some of the examples. Not all of them are the, uh, are the round ones, um, but the one that seemed to be the most common one. What, what do they mean? How do they mean those? Those are cut out of limestone, I think. Yeah. So here's a diagram of this what we saw earlier, this is um, a display on the wall in the museum. So here's a little bit, the dashed lines, this is my fingers now, right there. But what they did is they chopped this off, and that's what becomes the little bubble inside here. The, the roof is not in this diagram, yet, the roofing um, slates, yeah, the shingles. 
um, as I call them, going up here. So then you do get the smooth surface. But when you go inside of one of these, you can't see through here. And actually, that's a bit of a misnomer because that's not sitting on anything I just noticed. Um, but there's a style to this. Uh, well, I shouldn't say style. There's a form to this. I don't like the word style. People use it all the time in architecture. And I'm convinced the word style comes after the style has been created. No one sets out to, I'm going to do neo modern. It's like you do it, and then someone else, like a story, calls it neo modern. This is how they built because they needed to build this way. They knew how to build this way, and they had the materials to do it. Uh, so this next diagram is the next panel. So here's the inside vaulted arch there. Here's the little bubble. And here are these uh, chancarellas, I believe. Yeah, chancarellas. Uh, these are the thin slates tucked in here. And this all sort of works together to hold itself in place. And stone is dense, you know, even limestone certainly has some weight to it. So that's how it sort of one pushes down on the other. And the conical or the round shape is very important because it's stable all the way around. And every stone is pushing on every other stone. And you reach the point that you cap it with that um, the cone there, and that sort of holds it in place. So you couldn't do a gable roof with this. You'd have a flat end, although we did see what it looked like it did that. Um, it would be interesting to see how okay, it looks like that the, um, the, if we call them the stone shingles on the next area, yeah. they also slope the water very much. Exactly, and that's significant. Read into the literature, right? They, they're actually sloped, and collecting rainwater was significant. Um, and I'll show you some great photos of some uh, design drains that take them down into the gullies or um, into active cisterns. So this is one. This is not in Alpha Valley, I don't think. This is a, a little bit of disrepair, but it looks like there's holes in here. Yes, that's a void there, but if you go inside, it's probably stuffed with dirt or mud or little stones and then whitewashed on the inside. So you had an enclosed system. Um, so you couldn't let wind or water or bugs get through there. Um, so that's what some of them look like. So here's some other diagrams. I included this because I'm trying to explain you can put a round dome on a square space. The challenge becomes with the corners, right here and there, the four corners of these spaces. And as we saw in some of the other, you can kind of group them together. Um, and these, these aren't big spans. A lot of these spaces are very small. Um, and as I mentioned, you don't need four markers centering to build these. So you only need a couple of people, and you can kind of maybe just build yourself up, probably on a pile of stones, and then a scaffolding back then. Uh, and you sort of work your way around until you're at you know, the very top, putting in that last row. And then you crawl out and maybe finish it from the top. Um, they come in different sizes and different shapes. You also notice, I'll point out here, these walls on the perimeter are fairly thick because all the way these roof stones are pushing out with thrust, and you need to combat that thrust like with any arch. So then I get to the front. I just find these stones are beautiful, just in and of themselves, the color, the texture, the context, the, some of the, you know, the lighting that grows on them or something, and how long they've been there, and they're still working together uh, and relying on one another to hold each other up. Uh, well, every, every place has some degree of earthquakes, but there's, these are not rigid structures like modern concrete buildings, so I would argue these are actually have enough flex in them to withstand that. Um, I'm not familiar with how sensitive that region of the world is to earthquakes, um, but um, well, that's my sense. Um, so these drawings are, so, so Ed Mary Allen, my, my mentor, um, they said, oh, you're going to Puglia, you got to look up uh, Phil and Amy Rowe, and that's a great story there. Quickly, this couple from England moved to there to teach English for a year or two, and they never left. And they bought it truly, and they're like, well, what do we get ourselves into? So they, they found, this is before the internet probably, they found Ed's book, and then they like wrote to Ed and said, we bought it truly, you know, can you help us out? What should we do? Uh, we love your book, we're learning about it. So they invited him to Italy, so Ed went back to Italy after his 1969 trip. Uh, and he said, well, you got to go see him. And, and they invited me over for dinner. And um, got to see their house. And then they introduced me, you know, Ed introduced me to this woman I mentioned, uh, Amanda Morwell, who's the American architect who lives there. And she actually runs workshops on uh, reconstructing truly and, and how it's worked and for students and for people, I think, in the region, like Amy and Phil, who buy one and they want us to know how we maintain it and understand it. Uh, so these are her drawings that she hands out at the workshop and she shared those with me. Um, and they're very, you know, sort of not only photogenic but drawing genic. You know, it's sort of fun to study these and understand how they work. 
So what she's trying to show you here is what it looks like in plan, and then if you take a section through the building and you see these stones, you see the roof I talked about, fireplace, you might have an oven over here, notice that on the opposite sides, they can both provide warmth up to a space in the cooler months, the plan view. And then again, this, the outside can really be amorphous, it doesn't have to follow that square or shape necessarily. So back to the village again, as we see, uh, but now even we can see, you know, there's sort of a sloping roof that goes up into a cone. You do have your taller walls here, and some of these do start to appear. So my sense is this portion here is much newer. Um, the older ones are much more similar to that round, conical style with the, with the deep right here. But it's just, it's, it's remarkable the, the number of them and the location and the condition of them. And I think that's partly because of the, the heritage designation that is being taken care of. And the people come here um, for day trips. So it's a classic, it's sort of like their storage village. So it's, you know, you kind of go and see how people live. And but lots of shops and restaurants, and you can stay in some of them. So here's a shot between two roofs, so two spaces, or two truly. And here's the, the rain truck. And it comes down. And as David mentioned, these are slow, just like single. So, you know, wood shakes are a much later invention. They're doing the stone first, but it's first principles, right? Water wants to flow downhill, and you want to overlap. Um, and then this, I, I wonder about. So I take these photos, I come back from my computer and look at it. I, I, I bet they picked a stone that might have had some kind of curve through it. I would guess if that's been there for several hundred years, the water's done that for us. Or done it for the stone. And I think that really you know, speaks to the time and the evolution of these structures. Um, and the knowledge of the builders. Uh, some more drawings from stone shelters by Ed studying the massing of these buildings. So notice they're thick walls, because again I mentioned that's for stability, meaning structural holding it up, and also for thermal control. And the roofs, and you can kind of blend a couple of them there, but notice this, there has to be a support point here. You can have a doorway through it, certainly. But you've got to have a support point there so it all comes down. Another beautiful drawing by Amanda. The red shade is uh, our actual truly, and then the gray is sort of that other sort of mishmash, part truly, part more modern construction, and a bit adapted. Um, I wonder if they have, like we have around here, you know, historical commission saying what you can and can't do with your truly. I'm guessing they do, right? Because they probably wouldn't want, you know, that's the whole point of having this space. But it's sort of a living museum. Right, there's people who still live and work here, um, tourists can come, and uh, it's very well managed from my experience there. I was there in uh, December, actually. So another drawing of parts of the true love. Um, we've seen some of this before, but just gives you another idea of the, sort of the shape and the composition of these. And so this is a, a man drawing. Here's a smaller street in, in Alberta Bella, maybe not the main drag, but and you know, the, the people I met there when I was walking around, they were very comfortable with people photographing it. I'm, I'm sure they get a lot of architects coming through there, you know, with our sketchbooks and cameras and things. And I know a story about one, one house I was in search of, and I was very lucky to find it, actually. Uh, but uh, I show this to give you the idea of scale. You're not going to see a lot of cars on this street. It would fit one, certainly, but uh, it's a walking scene. It's not very big, um, so it's very uh, pedestrian based. So this is a neat story here. So this, um, when I started studying this, I went to see Ed and talked about his book. And this is the same house photographed 40 and then 50 years apart. So this was a National Geographic article on Alberta Bello with this house. And Ed showed up 40 years later, photographed that house. And this little girl here is that woman there 40 years later. And I, I didn't ask Ed where it was exactly, and I went off on a trip and so I asked him if I remember or not, and I said, I really want to find that one. And I walked, and I asked Amanda, she, she knew about it too, because she knew both of these pictures. And it's like this little cult of truly studiers, and I'm in it now. Um, and I did, I came around the corner, and I'm like, that's it. But nobody home, and I'm not even sure it's lived in right now. It looked a little unkempt, it wasn't on the main drag. But very little has changed. The one difference I can pick out is sort of one of those, you know, compare two photos. This is a uh, window right here. It doesn't appear the other two. But um, stunningly, otherwise, if you look at the roof, the arch, the door, um, very, very similar. Uh, so that was kind of really fun to experience that part of it. 
channeling my, uh, my mentor. So then um, I called Amanda, or WhatsApp, I believe it's WhatsApp over there. She said, you want to go on a walking tour? I said, I'd love to. Um, and I think it's what she does with her workshops when students come over. I'm trying to figure out how to get my students over there. Um, so he said, come on over. So I, it was just south of where I was staying. I drove down there. It was this tiny village. And I cannot remember the disposition of the land we were walking on. It was a large piece of property. Somebody presumably owns it. And it's OK, she said, for us to walk through and see these different buildings. And a lot of these we saw uh, are in ruin or are not occupied and not maintained. Uh, there's some evidence of, of squatting in this. But I really love this part because I can get inside, I can see the structure. Uh, these weren't all pristine whitewashed with pretty flowers in the UNESCO village. This was out in the farmlands. And we were free to walk around in Rome. We had a beautiful bay. Um, and here, and I love this too, I'm probably going to show this in class this semester because we got this arch right here. A true arch. You can really see how the stones are pushing on one another. And then this stone here, you know, it's still holding on. Now, I was a professor in graduate school in architecture, and he told us in the structures class that building will never fall down early. And he said that to his class, and I'm like, what does that mean? And I've been thinking about it almost ever since, and I think what I understand to mean is that structures want to resist load. You know, so you perhaps see a leaning barn, if you have one, and there's a lot of old buildings around. They'll lean over, but they will still resist load. They won't just say, oh, I'm going to fall over. And that's what this building is doing. And so right in here, it's pushing it on the top, it's pushing one against the other. The bottom's starting to fall away. And eventually it will go. It doesn't mean buildings stay up forever, but they will never fall down until they've you know, used up all their structural energy, so to speak. So then we came across this. This is almost a, a planned, I don't want to say community, but maybe a farm, maybe a farmstead, I might say. Um, there were several buildings, and this obviously, this does now, I said there were no plans or it certainly seems composed an idea. The center entrance, a little bigger than we're used to seeing some of them. This one's a little taller. Side one, that might be the kitchen over there with the chimney, maybe a little living space here. And there's a courtyard that faces south, get the warmth. There was a, a barn on the property as well, a stone. Uh, it had a concrete vaulted roof, so we could tell that was more water. Um, but then it was Early big mansion. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but just <coughs> and this was great because it, it, there's no one around out there, so you could, we could crawl up on some of them, and we could really get close to the material. And just I'm just fascinated by the the color, the shapes, the the growth on them, how they look and feel. Um, this is one of the bigger ones we saw, and it's sort of a triple truly. Um, and this is a our agriculture is the barn use. Um, but you know, here I am. It's a, a, a Tuesday morning, in December. I'm walking down, and this road though, could be in a lot of different places, right? So instead of in southern Italy, maybe this is northern New England or something. A beautiful little road with a stone wall and a barn. This one just happens to be stone. Um, and this is of a bigger scale too. If you look at the size of that roof, much bigger than the little uh, shepherd house type style. And then these might be a little out of order, but this is sort of an entrance to this whole display. It's a, it looks like a gatehouse, almost sort of you know uh, mystical, right? You have this old road here, this path, um, and these two little buildings that you walk into this arena. Any other in there? Not in these either. Uh, these looked in a little better shape, um, uh, but these none of them were occupied. Um, and then this one. Would they be like seasonal? Um, and not, e not even these. Some of them are. Um, but uh, so. Like a summer house? Yeah, well, the, the Albert Bell was unique. That's that sort of the postcard one I keep saying. Then there were others, like my, my friends, Amy and Phil. They live in one that's private. They have their land, they have their truly. And it's a great little home. It has four cones on it, I think. So they have four rooms, and then it's maybe a more modern addition. Uh, some are rented out. Airbnbs. Um, some are still used agriculturally, so it really ranges. Uh, but again, here we have the stones clinging to one another. Uh, this one certainly is still standing, but doesn't look so great. Excuse me. And then you know you take these photos and then you put them together. And this, I think it was this morning. I noticed there's a wire coming into this building, right? So this looks like someone had put some up. So 
I think he's had they go through eras of lives, so there's probably in the 60s these might have been used. Um, but again, this is this region of Italy is, is fairly poor. It's not um, urbanized. It's still quite agricultural. Um, it's uh, a little off the beaten path, especially up on the plateau. If you go to the coast, you're going to have much more. But those images I showed you earlier, um, stories like that. So a little bit of the story wrapping up here. Um, uh, these real big thank yous that led me on this adventure that I hope maybe turns into um, a paper or something or another project. But this is Amanda on our walking tour. There's my good friends Ed and Mary Allen. And if you notice, this is his kitchen, Wayland Mass. But look at the he designed that over his stove, a little Italian uh, the tile. And I couldn't find a photo. He has a cottage up in New Hampshire that is built like one of these Trulies. Um, that, because he built it in 1970, right after he got back from the trip to, to Italy. Uh, this is what I got to stay in. Uh, this one was called the, uh, the, uh, the Conti Setti. So instead of the House of Seven Gables, this was the House of Seven Cones. So it was a multiple unit, so that's the one I got to stay in. I did bring the book with me, and I just happened to put it down on a stone wall one day when I was taking a break for lunch, and it's just the, these stones are back right there from his photograph from back in the 60s. This was the house of the neighbors. It was right near where I was staying, the, the English couple. So they said, we well, gotta come over and visit. We wanna hear all about you know, why you're here, what you're learning. And uh, so I walked in their house, and hanging on the wall is a sketch by my mentor, Ed, dated 2007. So he had made a return trip there in 2007 to meet Amy and Phil, who had bought his book. And there's his sketch on the wall, and that's a sketch of their house. Um, so I get a kick out of those things. Um, and I learned from them. Um, so I think with that, I will say grazie, and uh, see if there's any uh, questions anybody might have. How many people live in Um, just not, a, not a large amount. You know, there's been, <laughs> yeah, uh, couples. Uh, I probably would probably want to see a family in any of these. Uh, okay. Maybe historically, yes, but not now. And how do they decorate? Inside, like inside? Yeah. Um, I don't have any interior shots. Uh, I might be able to find you one. Do they have beds? Yep, yep. Oh, I slept in a bed. Car yeah. uh, tile floors. Tile floors. So what's yep. floor? Anything uh, there was There was an area rug on the tile floor uh, in the living space of the one I had. So the one I stayed in, you walked into a main room at the cone roof. That was like the living dining. Off to the side was a kitchen and a bathroom. And then in the back was the bedroom. So just like four rooms technically, I guess. What, um, is, what is the bathroom situation? Oh, modern plumbing. Yeah. Although, uh, it's my first day there, and I'm in the shower, and the power goes out. <laughs> so, I get on my WhatsApp to the landlady, it's like, can help me out. But luckily, the power came back. Yeah, so, especially the, any of the Airbnbs, they're all modern communities. This is TVs and, and things like that. Um, so, what I did find was the you know the old historic room ones, and I'm very interested because I can see the construction. Yes. The newer ones are kind of fun to learn about to stay in, but you know, are they really the truly? And that's another thing we architects when you go study a building, buildings change over time, right? I mean we use this now, it's not a schoolhouse anymore, we use it for something else. Anybody else? Yeah, any earthquakes out there? Yeah, we had that question earlier. I have to look into that. Um, how you know, anywhere in the world can have an earthquake, how engineers look at it is certain zones are higher uh, seismic zones, they call them. So west coast of the U.S., uh, San Andreas, the east coast actually of the U.S. is a high seismic zone, maybe not a seismic west coast, Japan, you know, so it has to do with the continents. Um, so I don't know, but my sense is, like a, a small wood frame structure, you know, Ben, right, has a lot of gift to it, a lot of redundancy. These have a lot of redundancy and a lot of gift. Um, doesn't mean they're going to survive. But I think my sense is that they're better than a stiff concrete building. Concrete buildings fight these kind of flex, and that's kind of the theory, the modern theory of uh, seismic resistance and structures is not to fight the forces, but to form them. And I think these did that well. Is that the case in the water? Yes, exactly. Yep. What do they do with the drinking water? Do they use the cisterns or just? Yes, yep. Um, historically, they did, not anymore. Now there's more. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, well. Yes. Yeah. 
What are the capstones made out of? And is, it, is that all one piece, or is it several stones and they're painted? Or Right there, the top. Yeah. I think it's sort of what you see on the inside, so the stones go all the way to the top, but then they cover that part with, like, uh, you know, sort of fill it in, and then that plaster sort of lime mortar over the top of it, and then they set a carved, I think it's limestone on the top of it. And that's sort of the, to tie it all together. Why are those um, limestones in the landscape, the one where they're open, to show the picture of the water, yeah. all, I mean, pretty evenly separate, it's not like over in England, like what, there's a gold rod like that. Yeah. Right? Well, they, they had to be hardened. I mean, uh, a lot of the landscape, the, the pieces are already pieces, right? The, the, those cliffs that you saw, you could harvest limestone because it's easier to cut them. But why did they come to like, why did the lime do that in layers? Oh, uh, because of how it was, um, uh, it's decayed the uh, materials over time, over time, over centuries um, from the ocean. From the, I think there was one line there about shellfish and mollusks and things like that. You can see a very similar situation if you've ever been to St. Augustine, Florida. Right along the harbor there is the same condition of that kind of limestone. Yeah, it's, it's very layerish. It feels has, has layers as opposed to uh, slabs, if you will. But I highly encourage you, if you ever go to Italy, to take a trip down to the southern part. It's very different than northern Italy, certainly, and very different than the major cities. Um, but definitely worth it, and I can't wait to get back. We were there a couple of years ago, but we were also very interested in the cave dwellings. Mm -hmm. Did you visit any of them? Not on this trip, no. I would okay. love to see them now. And I think I had one comment in there about it. If you look over time, before you start to build, you know, real early cultures, you need a place to stay, you go in a cave, you know, yeah. cave yeah. people. And, and there's a wonderful book, I don't know if you know, by Levy, um, called Christ Stopped at Eboli. Uh, and it's a, the story of how um, during the Second World War, um, Levy, who was an artist, was sent as a punishment because he was not in favor of the fascist government. He was sent there and he really wanted to paint, but he, he was, people were so poor and in need of medicine that he uses his skills as a physician. And I think they made a movie out of it as well. It's, but it's the same area. We didn't study the structure that we did, but we, yeah. we found the, the, the survival of the people who lived there remarkable. And, and, that, and that book is, is a really classic. So L-E-V-Y? L-E-V-Y. And I can't okay. remember if it was Primo Levy, and this is a different Levy. But this was great. I never noticed the decorative quality on the. Not all of them had it, certainly. Yeah. Um, but I, I'm just fascinated by, you know, I spent a lot of time looking at modern architecture with my students and things, and I'm fascinated by these because these were built long before people had agendas or budgets or trying to outdo the other guy or make a statement or make mansions. I mean, they were trying to survive and, and worship and maybe gather. You know, that was, it was pretty fundamental, and the buildings really do that well. So I think there are, I guess my point is there's lessons to be learned from this design architecture without architects. So, thank you all for listening.